Thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar on COVID-19 and the crisis in India. The second wave of the virus has brought devastating effects to many regions of the country with record cases of infection and a shattering death toll. According to official figures assembled by Johns Hopkins University, India is second only to the United States in case numbers with more than 25 million confirmed cases and more than 250,000 deaths. In the last month alone, figures from Johns Hopkins indicate that 10 million cases and 100,000 deaths have occurred. The actual figures may be a great deal higher. Earlier in this, uh, this month, Brown University's Dean of the School of Public Health, Ashish Jha, has suggested that 25,000 Indians may be dying per day. The Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington has projected the possibility of a total of 1.2 million deaths by the time we reach August. The scale of suffering is in any case immense. Stories of shortages of oxygen cylinders and hospital beds have been widely circulated and images of funeral pyres give some sense of the extent of loss and grief. Today's discussion is an opportunity in Ireland to gain a more intimate sense of this terrible experience from contributors based in different parts of India and to learn from various perspectives on the crisis, including the personal, the social, historical, medical, and political. My name is Daniel Carey and I'm director of the Moore Institute for the Humanities and Social Studies at the National University of Ireland Galway. I am also the Royal Irish Academy Secretary for Humanities and Social Sciences. Today's event is jointly sponsored by these two organizations as a forum for discussion of a humanitarian crisis in which we all have a stake. Over 170 people have signed up to attend today. Again, thank you very much for joining us. The session forms part of, a, uh, of, of two different series, one that's been run by the Moore Institute and another that's been run by the Royal Irish Academy. And recordings of previous sessions are available on these uh, organizations' respective websites. I'm very grateful to David Kelly for running things behind the scenes in the Moore Institute and to, for, to Jennifer Keneally in the Royal Irish Academy uh, for help running this event. The diverse group of panelists joining us today draw on wide experience and professional backgrounds. And I will now introduce them alphabetically. Kanchana Mahadevan is professor in the Department of Philosophy, University of Mumbai. She teaches and researches in the areas of feminist philosophy, decolonization, critical theory, political thought, aesthetics, and film. Her book, Between Femininity and Feminism, Colonial and Postcolonial Perspectives on Care, 2014, examines the relevance of Western feminist philosophy in the Indian context. She's currently working on the relationship between the secular and the post-secular from comparative and gendered perspectives. She's also examining populism and democracy from the perspective of comparative philosophy. In 2019, she was a visiting fellow in the Moore Institute at NUI Galway. Dr. Sanjay Nagral is director of the Department of Surgical, Surgical Gastroenterology at Jashlak Hospital and Research Center in Mumbai. And he also heads the Department of General Surgery at the KV Baba Municipal General Hospital. He held fellowships at the King's College Hospital and the Royal Free Hospital in London from 1995 to 97. Among his many publications, he co-edited the book, Healers or Predators, Healthcare Corruption in India, published by Oxford University Press in 2018. He was the Joint Secretary for the Zonal Transplant Coordination Committee based in Mumbai from 2012 to 2017. In addition to his work as publisher and member of the editorial board of, of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, he writes for a range of publications on issues of public health, medical ethics, and organ transplantation, including the Times of India, Indian Express, Hindustan Times, Mumbai, the British Medical Journal, Scroll, and Wire. Since last year, he's been writing a weekly column called Second Opinion for the Mumbai Mirror, Mumbai's largest circulating English language newspaper. Dr. Srinivas Raghavendran is lecturer in economics at the J.E. Cairns School of Business and Economics at NUI Galway. His current research focuses on several major themes in the areas of macroeconomics, finance, and political economy, appearing in a range of international journals. He has spoken at leading global events like the International Monetary Fund and the International Economic Forum of the Americas. He's been a visiting professor at Paris, uh, Panthéon Sorbonne, La Sapienza University in Rome, Johannes Kepler University in Austria, and the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. In India, Raghav has served as an expert economist for the development priorities for Rajasthan and development priorities for Andhra Pradesh projects as part of the, um, and this is part of the Indian prioritization project conducted by the Indian uh, Consensus Center in New Delhi. 
Opik Sen is a freelance writer, teacher, and collaborator with artists. He lives in Calcutta and works across the arts, literature, cinema, and music. He studied English literature at University College Oxford and worked as associate editor of the Telegraph Calcutta. He was given the 2009 Infinity Award for writing on photography by the International Center for Photography in New York. Archana Venkatesh is assistant professor of history at Clemson University in the US. She's a graduate of the Ohio State University and her research interests lie at the intersection of South Asian history, oral history, women's history and the history of medicine. She's currently working on a manuscript titled Women, Medicine and Nation Building, The Lady Doctor and Development in 20th Century South India, which examines the role of women doctors in the creation and extension of development initiatives in South India from 1919 to 1970. Her research has been supported by the American Institute of Indian Studies. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to all of you for joining us today in such difficult circumstances. It's a really important, I think, moment to gather and to uh, seek insight from you and your experience and outlook. Raghav, I'd like to start with you if I could. Um, uh, you're based in Madurai at the moment, and um, you've had obviously quite harrowing personal and family circumstances, but I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what you've been observing and your, your thoughts on the crisis in India at the moment. Uh, well, in terms of where I am, uh, I, I live in a state called Tamil Nadu in the southern part of India, and a city called Madurai is about 450 kilometers down south of Chennai, or Madras, what it used to be called. Uh, I'm in a rural part outside the city. Uh, at this point in time, my local locality or local village is uh, about 12,000 people, which is on a, it's called, it's a red zone. So I can't go out anywhere. It's a total lockdown here. About 500, uh, 600 cases every day in this area alone. And uh, it's been quite uh, very tough for the past uh, a month or so in this, uh, as Tamil Nadu started picking. Uh, this, the case numbers are rising and the uh, death rate is also going up, fatality rates are going up and a uh, lot of people I see in the rural parts uh, between Madurai city as well as in the rural areas that are not reporting and so on and so forth. There's a lot of uh, uh, issues in terms of hospital beds, lack of av availability of lack of uh, beds, oxygen and so on and so forth. What I observed, uh, you know, from, from say November to uh, April uh, this year, you know, as case numbers came down in January, and there was a sense of triumphalism that began to emerge in India, and it, it was buttressed by a faith of unique Indian uh, Indianness or Indian exceptionalism. Uh, you know, it, that actually got carried away in, uh, in terms of both uh, elections that happened in the five states, as well as the religious festivals that happened across India. Particularly, coverage was given to Kumbh, Kumbh Mail. Kumbh Mela, which was happened in, uh, it happens every 12 years. It's uh, for those who don't know about Kumbh Mela, it's, it's, uh, it happens every 12 years. People take ritual dip in holy rivers of Ganges and so on in the North India. Uh, that actually uh, created a wave uh, that happened, that happens from January to March. And the election commission started this election preparations. And uh, from, from November to January, uh, November to April, they had a lead time uh, in terms of preparing for this second wave or preparing for the future, but nothing of that sort happened. You know, uh, there was a, a national executive council uh, which meets under this National Disaster Management Act, never met. You had temporary COVID facilities that were set up by central organization that were lying largely empty since December, and they began to dismantle all that. Genome sequencing, uh, you know, proceeded at a leisure space, nothing happened in terms of sequencing. 167 oxygen generating plants had been sanctioned after 2020 peak, but there was a little follow up and 32 had been set up till mid April. Other things like banning exports of vaccine in end of March, no attempt was made to relook either at ramping of vaccine production or accelerating pace of vaccinations. There was a willful neglect of approaching a uh, second wave uh, because of the leadership, of, you know, central and state caught up with politics. And April 15th, you know, you, you, we crossed about 2 lakh, 200,000 uh, new cases and, and, and doubling uh, on 30th April and so on and so forth. I just want to leave with one general comment that I, I, I've been thinking about it on, on this, you know, the whole episode. 
both the first wave and second second wave. And uh, you know, if one steps back from this grim situation that is unfolding, uh, you know, it is a fusion of two hegemonic political projects. If one is the Indutva based political ideology that constructs a nation state in terms of a pure singular identity being an Indian and seeks to establish an exclusivist majoritarian nation. The other one is the neoliberalism, a global project that proposes well-being be cast advanced by liberating individuals, you know, with an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights and so on. But critical to this fusion uh, is the role of state, a reconfiguration of the role of state, particularly in Indian context. It is an Indian variant, as I would say, or Indian neoliberalism has taken a distinctive form with variations and contradictions as it interacts with reinforces and reshapes the underpinning social context of deep rooted Brahminical patriarchy, a worldview that's structuring of the social order, which is based on upper caste purity and that places the lower caste and women in subservient position. And this plays out all the time in all the uh, you know, issues and policies that we see over and over, whether it's lack of beds, lack of oxygen, lack of you know infrastructure, or in terms of rural areas, lack of other amenities and so on, it just plays out in terms of uh, this, this, this. I would say this confluence of of India, Indian liberal liberalism, as you say, Hindutva liberalism, rooted in this patriarchy, actually is is actually creating problem, not just today, for the future as well. And that's my take on it so far. Thank you very much. There's a lot to come back uh, to there. Um, I wanted to turn to Sanjay, if I might. Um, Sanjay, you're working in the in the in the hospital system. Uh, you're you're a surgeon by training, uh, but you're also commenting on on medical affairs in India. So I wonder if you could talk to us about your experience in in, in Mumbai or more widely. Right. So I uh, I, I don't quite uh, know where to where to begin, but. Uh, of course, everybody, uh, most of the world now knows about the gory details of uh, what's played out in India in the last year and also now, especially in the last few months. And I think uh, COVID uh, affected uh, many countries, uh, but I think what's been peculiar to India is uh, number one, uh, the complete uh, lack of uh, access to healthcare. We know COVID is a bad disease and COVID kills, but uh, in the current wave, especially, we have had uh, people dying because they could not get oxygen and could not get into hospital. So uh, I think that's uh, that's something that is uh, uh, peculiar and, and very, very depressing. Uh, having said that, uh, anyone who uh, works in Indian healthcare or knows Indian healthcare closely uh, would not be uh, would be very disappointed and depressed, but not be very surprised at the turn of events. Uh, because uh, we have a very dysfunctional healthcare system, um, which is uh, strangely highly privatized, uh, but completely unregulated, and with uh, very limited access for the last, large majority. And on the other hand, the public healthcare system is underfunded uh, and in complete retreat over the last few years. And that in a, in a way links to uh, uh, what Srinivas just said, that we have chosen to a path of, uh, even in healthcare, a path of private development. Uh, but I think there are two or three other factors that played out uh, in, in looking, looking at the, to, to analyze the uh, the sheer severity of, of our problem. The first, of course, is that India has a very big uh, uh, system of traditional system of medicine. And, and we all, uh, of course, respect that system. But what has happened is that every system of medicine in India claims its own treatment, its own cure for COVID. And that's completely muddled the situation. And science has never been our uh, strength. And therefore, we, what we have also seen is the use of lots of unproven therapies, some of them uh, deadly therapies. So for example, a lot of the problems that we're seeing now is due to the rampant use of steroids. And as all of you would know, steroids are very double-edged medicines, very double-edged drugs. So I think uh, this has further worsened the situation. And finally, before I conclude, I just want to say that 
the peculiar uh, situation in, especially in the second wave, uh, and what is perhaps unique is that the elite of India, who had sort of protected themselves from the ravages of daily disease and healthcare by by creating this private healthcare system, have suddenly been exposed. People have died without beds. People have died without oxygen. And I think that is one reason why there is so much of an uproar, uh, because the elite have been affected. And, and the Indian diaspora across the world uh, is also very upset because their parents, their fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters are, are suffering and dying. So what has actually been a chronic problem over the years has suddenly burst out because there is huge uh, people who matter have been affected. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that, uh, the, 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 the distinctive nature of the medical care system is obviously a crucial consideration. And I suppose it speaks, as you were saying, to what the Raghav was making about the, the I suppose, the, the neoliberal dimension of how, how, how the system works in an Indian context. There are also echoes of the United States in many of the things that you're saying, particularly in, in the you know, uh, somewhat fanciful cures that uh, have evidently become you know, enacted in different sorts of ways. Uh, Kanchana, I wonder if I could uh, turn to you now. And um, you're also based in Mumbai. You're uh, you're a, a professor of philosophy. And what you, how how have you responded to the crisis? What what do you think we should be thinking about and understanding the particular form it has taken in India? You're muted there, Phil. Uh, yeah, as a uh, someone who is a teacher, as someone who is in the context of uh, institutional teaching, um, I have noticed that uh, this particular pandemic has, in a way, uh, changed uh, academic life because we went on to the online teaching mode. You know, so uh, we had. Um, uh, a way of uh, getting all our computers uh, together, getting our homes uh, organized, and uh, letting um, everyone into our homes via uh, the online uh, uh, digital mode, such as Google Meet and Zoom and so forth. So in a way, what I noticed this uh, pandemic uh, has led to is a kind of a blurring of the public and the private domains. and. On the positive side, you know, um, it is a, in a way, I think the digital technology has helped us mediate. So that is uh, very positive because uh, when people were seeking help um, for oxygen cylinders and beds and so forth, uh, people were volunteering on social media to help out with that. Um, uh, vaccination appointments were being taken on computer apps and uh, social interaction itself has become online. So in, in some way, this is helping us cope with the grief, solve problems, uh, be compassionate to one another. You know, uh, so I think in these uh, respects, it, it all looks very good at one level. Uh, it reminds me of a um, short uh, novel by uh, Rabindranath Tagore um, uh, called Chaturanga. You know, it had two characters, two brothers, Jagmohan and Harimohan. Uh, Harimohan is indifferent to the plague that ravages Calcutta uh, because he is uh, obsessed. Uh, he's a kind of a fundamentalist, um, obsessed with uh, just um, turning to God for resolving issues. And Jagmohan is very uh, literary. Uh, he has studied and read a lot of books and he's very sensitive uh, to the pain of others, but he ends up succumbing uh, uh, in the course of being compassionate. Uh, so I think that this online education in a way gives us a choice of not succumbing, but at the same time being compassionate and uh, uh, sharing the grief, partaking in the grief and so forth. But there is a very big um, issue. Uh, the one question we teachers keep asking students and students ask us is uh, a question that Nell Noddings, the philosopher of care, has brought up as a very important question in pedagogy. So this has naturally emerged in my pedagogic context, at least uh, in the course of teaching. What are you going through just now? You know, so how are you doing? How is your connectivity? Uh, is it working out? 
etc you know so uh, and then um, uh, are you able to give your assignments no because i can't give my assignments i can't meet the deadlines because i've not had connectivity i've not um, uh, my smartphone broke down and so forth so one has to uh, think beyond the rules orientation and the deadline orientation in academics to actually do the business of uh, thinking and writing and working together. So I think in that sense, um, um, it has been a positive thing. But then uh, Hari Mohan, the very uh, sort of indifferent brother in uh, Tagore's um, uh, novel haunts us uh, because to what degree is this compassion really reaching out? This is a question I've been asking myself. Uh, we confront the digital divide. So there are enormous inequities, the kind of inequities uh, that were brought out by the previous panelists uh, based on caste, uh, gender, class, and uh, several of our students cannot afford, for example, to live in the city of Mumbai because we have a subsidized hostel that is not available during the pandemic. So they have to go to the rural areas. Uh, they don't get connectivity. They are not able to uh, um, give their exams. Uh, uh, there was a, a student who wrote when it is too late because that student was feeling too um, uh, shy to tell us about uh, the fact that she could not even afford a smartphone. Uh, so somewhere this digital technology is viewed as a private commodity, a neoliberal private commodity. So unless we treat it as a public good, something that is available to all, <coughs> excuse me, something that is accessible to all, I think this problem is going to persist. And so if the caring, compassionate part of education um, has to be really taken ahead, I think one would have to uh, convert a lot of the uh, um, devices into freely available commodities for all, yeah. for genuine, uh, equitable compassion. Yeah. Thank that you. is. Thank you. Yeah, there are questions there we definitely want to come back to, and and some of the points you've been making resonate in different ways in Ireland, of course. And there's been some attention to the, to the digital divide, but not necessarily any any particular solutions coming forward. Uh, Opik, I wonder if I could come to you next. Uh, you're you're based in in Calcutta, and I I know this is, moment has affected you and your, your your family closely. I wonder if you could share your observations on the pandemic and the the second wave, as it's been referred to, of the crisis. Yes, I'm going to keep my observations, Dan, quite micro and quite concrete and quite limited to the personal and the domestic because in a way we are all leading domestic lives now. And, uh, and I, I completely second uh, Srinivas and Sanjay's uh, larger economic, medical, political, social, sociological analysis of the situation. Uh, what I want to add to this is that I want to speak now as a teacher uh, and in that way I continue what Kanchana have, has begun to outline. Uh, I feel you know, I teach the liberal arts, humanities, the arts, the visual arts, cinema. And what is happening is that my students and the people that I'm interacting with are having to ask extremely radical fundamental questions about the relevance of what they are reading and learning and making and regurgitating in their academic or creative lives in relation to their own bodies, the bodies of others, in relation to death and mortality, in relation to caregiving, and in relation to domestic work and labor. And, and this is making them ask questions to which, you know, these questions themselves, important and vital and fundamental as they are, are actually leading to a crisis which I, as a teacher or even as a collaborator with artists, I can only live the questions. I cannot, I cannot really resolve them. Uh, and I think this is an extremely important transformation in our relationship with what we do and how we think that is happening at an extremely bodily concrete level. The other thing that is happening is that this 
this divide, this inequality, it's not something that is between us and them. It's, it's right there in our homes. You know, I live with an elderly uh, person who is invalid and her attendant is the person who died in our household after suffering from COVID. And we realize while dealing with her illness and with her death, uh, what, what the nitty gritty of dealing both with the medical aspect of it and her family and with the afterlife of her death meant for someone from that class, that gender, that caste meant to us, uh, you know, we who are privileged middle, upper middle class people who are connected on the internet and what it meant for us to actually confront her family, to, to give her the care that she needed and to also to deal with our grief and to somehow make our grief for her a, a sort of a mere attendant in our household, somehow real and, and communicable to people like us who would say, oh, well, okay, you, you all tested negative, so, you know, you're fine. So this is something that we have been brought, I mean, extremely closely uh, in, in contact with, and we are still working this out psychologically, intellectually, critically, and I'm not even going into the political aspect of what it means for us as citizens and as persons to, uh, to confront in our own lives what Srinivas and Sanjay have been outlining in macro terms. Perhaps in our Q&A, we can do that. So I've deliberately kept my, uh, what I had to say to my own little sphere of life at home at the moment. Thank you, thank you, Opik. And I, I think you draw attention to one of the problems which I think has been experienced at some level in a worldwide way, which is the intimacy of grief and loss against the backdrop of an enormous loss and the distorting and uh, the distorting effects of grief in that in that moment. So maybe that's something we can come back to and try to try to think our way through. And the meaning of art, what does it mean to be an artist or a writer or a creative person or a poet in this kind of a time? Yeah, well, that is a great question. I'm very interested in. So hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to come back to that. Arch, if I could turn to you now, and um, you're based in the US, so you're in this difficult position of having family in India and trying to maintain those connections. I'm sure it must be particularly distressing and, and you experience that, that distance, no doubt, in, in a much more acute fashion. Uh, but your research is also extremely interesting and I think relevant to the, to the questions that we've been looking at. So I wonder if I could uh, ask you to comment. Yeah, absolutely. It has been, I will say, um, an incredibly difficult time to, you know, not be uh, with my family or, or not see anyone in my family for what feels like it has been yours, actually. Um, but yeah, uh, that was really fascinating. I was so, so, um, I mean, there's so many connections between what everyone else was saying. And I think as a historian who works on, you know, the history of the institutionalization of medicine in India. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that I've been reading and um, something that we've all been reading, I bet, about India in the past few weeks, which is this massive headline that says the system has failed, right? But here's the thing though, the, the system hasn't failed. It's done exactly what it's meant to do, which is not exist. Um, one of the horrifying statistics that's come out in the wake of the second wave is that India invests, by some estimates, anywhere between uh, 0.3 to 1.3% of its GDP into public health infrastructure, which, you know, in comparison to um, other countries in similar developmental stages is pretty poor, uh, just numerically speaking. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to understand is why is this investment so low, uh, especially since privatization of healthcare didn't really take off until the 1980s with the rise of the Apollo group of medical hospitals, which are now the site of some amazing medical tourism are being touted as, you know, 
whatever since star medical hospitals and all of that stuff that we keep reading about um and i wanted to go back a little bit to the british colonial policy making which was really the roots of indian developmental policy making with the five year plans right um and the first time we see any kind of institutionalization of western medicine in india is with the massive plague in the 1890s and the way in which this was policed loads of other things but the thing that really struck me was this led to the rise of caste based hospitals right so it already revealed the fractures and the hierarchies of which is what make up modern indian society which is caste hierarchies and like raghav said brahminical patriarchy so the thing that indian well mostly hindu citizens objected or subjects i should say objected to the most was being put in isolation wards with people of lower castes so the way in which this medical developmental policy making was instituted was based on exclusions and divisions uh this went on to inform uh the rise of you know the welfare state model of healthcare provision that is public healthcare right with the first five year plan in 1950 and a lot has been said about the first five year plans focused on industry and the industrialization you know nehru famously said dams are the temples of modern india that's what we should be working towards building up industry and there wasn't a lot of focus on healthcare and when there was any kind of mention of developing healthcare for this massive population it was folded in with other developmental goals mostly family planning which was something that was disseminated all over india rural and urban targeted at poor people and lower caste people by and large so one of the reasons why privatization of healthcare was able to take a hold of the system so well a stranglehold really um was because of this lack of attention and lack of public funding when it comes to public healthcare systems um and i wanted to talk a little bit about privatization which was you know antithetical to the goals of this mixed economy that the nehruvian development goals were trying to create um the founder of apollo pratap reddy said that he had to go through the rings of fire of indian bureaucracy to set up his hospitals which are incredibly successful today and became even easier after neo liberalize i mean sorry after the liberalization in the 90s as we talked about but the thing that gets missed out in this picture is that private hospitals were not overwhelmed by the first wave of the covid pandemic in india that's not what happened what's happening today is that private hospitals are being overwhelmed which reveals exactly who's able to access these private hospitals you know they are expensive it is only those of upper middle class and upper classes who are able to access healthcare and this shockingly means that most of the population has been affected by the first wave that is most of the migrant labor and the rural labor population it's just that it wasn't reported on and they um the people who were affected by the first wave are not able to access these this um fully funded seven star medical care right um i was actually thinking a lot about the whole welfare state model right we are so proud of our public distribution system and uh you know our the national rural employment guarantee scheme the thing that gets missed out is that migrant laborers who are from rural parts of india cannot access any of these benefits if they work in cities which most of them do um i'm sure we all remember from the first wave this incredibly horrifying image of uh, workers moving from delhi to rural parts of bihar and up where they were from getting like physically sprayed down by disinfectant right and the reason that they are moving to rural parts is because that's where they can access 
any kind of state support. So there's a lot of holes in the system and it was designed that way. So the system hasn't failed. That's just what it's meant to do. And I wanted to end with um, something that I've also been thinking about because India has a massive child immunization program, right? So it seemed optimistic to assume that our vaccine rollout would be uh, possible, uh, even streamlined. Um, the thing that we've all seemed to have overlooked in that assumption is that India does not have an adult immunization program ready to go. It's limited to child vaccination programs. And I'll stop there. And, and Arch, if I could ask you, is that particularly in relation to polio or is it more generally with child Im immunization programs? Sure, it's polio. It is also um, the BCG, uh -huh. Like, you know, measles, diphtheria, and the other thing that I've forgotten, but all of these um, vaccines that you get as a child. Right. Yeah. So those, that, <laughs> because there yeah. has been some attention drawn to that. Obviously, it's an issue we haven't talked about is also vaccine production and pharma, you know, pharma generally in India, which is so extraordinary. So there's some, there's some paradoxes. There's some very interesting and striking themes of continuity um, and experience in Europe, but also some very, very particular and distinctive disjunctions, I guess, if I can put it that way. So yeah, I guess we'll, we'll kind of have our sort of more general discussions. So everybody can kind of you know, turn, your, turn your cameras on and we'll, we'll kind of reconvene, so to speak. Um, Raghav, I might begin with you. There's a couple of questions that have come through. And one is um, asking about your thoughts on why the positive cases in the US are, in terms of numbers, are higher than in India when the US didn't have the equivalent of Comella or elections. I mean, I don't know if you feel um, especially comfortable in commenting on the US situation, but there are these paradoxes. Um, I was thinking partly in relation to what Arch was saying about, oh, so the US has an enormous investment in its healthcare system, and yet uh, is still world leading in this tragic uh, set, of, set of tables. So I don't know, uh, uh, you know, Raghav, if you had any particular uh, thoughts uh, on the yeah, US. Yeah, I can, I can just say that, uh, you see the, uh, as, as Archana pointed out, um, we don't have that kind of, uh, infrastructure. 1% of GDP is what we spend on public health. And if you look at the out of pocket, I mean, health expenditure by individuals, it's out of pocket. 60% of the health expenditure is out of pocket expenditure of the total expenditure of individuals. So when you, I, I live in a rural part in, in Tamil Nadu, I, I speak to people uh, before the lockdown and so on. You know, they are afraid to go for uh, testing. Because the moment you go for testing, if you are, you know, deemed, if you get the positive result, you are immediately picked out, picked by the, you know, panchayat or the municipal uh, uh, corporation people, and then you are, you are put in some hospital. You don't know. It, it could be public hospital. If you are public hospital, you are lucky. You don't pay. But then, if you get into private hospitals, you are finished, because people have not, you know, come out of their debt from the first wave, mind you. You know, people are indebted from the first wave of the lockdown and so on. People have no money to pay, and these are not uh, easy, you know, simple sums that one is talking about. So, when you when you talk about one percent GDP, even the Economic Survey of 2021 says, which government publishes, that if you extend, if you increase your public health expenditure by one more percent, you will reduce the out-of-pocket expenditure by half. And in, you know, that will actually help. So, people are not going forward, you know, uh, to for testing. That that could be one reason that. Uh, you can, you can see why. Yeah, I mean, I think there must be an enormous number of contributing factors, but I think there's general agreement, at least in the commentary that I've read, that, that there is very serious underreporting, and that can be viewed in different ways, that there's something nefarious about the underreporting, but it can just be a structural issue, I think, in light of, what, of what's been said. That seems you know, intuitively to be the case. Can, can I just add on to one more thing to that? In, the, the, in, the, in, the, in Tamil Nadu particularly, I'm, I'm talking about Tamil Nadu rural areas, People do believe that, you know, the, what Sanjay said about the uh, Ayurvedic uh, and, and, and the medicine, uh, the concoctions mm -hmm. that they have, the three concoctions that are very famous in Tamil Nadu. In fact, government actually prescribes these concoctions, nine herbal mix called Kabasura Kudinir. Then you have 15 uh, herbal mix called uh, Nilavembu Kudinir. This is, you know, neem and so on herbal. And there's the other one, arsenic alba. You know, these are something that is prescribed by the government. 
people take it and they think that they got the immunity they get the immunity and they don't think that they should go on test so many people say oh i I've, i'm not feeling good i'm going to have that kabasura kudinir or whatever that herbal mix is and that's about it i got the immunity so they do believe the uh, of of the traditional indian medicine because you didn't have any medicine before in the first wave so people were taking these concoctions and then that continues right so mm-hmm. that that is also a contributing factor for why people are not going for testing and they they actually think that this actually works right yeah sanjay i wonder if i could ask you a little bit possibly about that but um I'm also interested in in the phenomenon of regional variation in India. I mean, it is obviously a vast country, um, so that's probably not not unexpected. But do you have any comment on 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 the nature of that? Is about is that the way the healthcare system works? That certain regions have been more effective in their public health measures, or I, you know, can you help us think about that? Yeah. So so yes, uh, India. Uh, some people would say is actually many countries put together, and there is huge. Uh, variation even in uh, many other parameters but certainly at care uh, i think the if you study the uh, the reasons for the variation it is uh, probably linked to uh, uh, the way those states developed uh, kerala is an example uh, kerala is always the example uh, mm-hmm. where uh, uh, where where you had uh, high levels of literacy you had actually a, a huge politicization of healthcare in, in the good sense of the term and therefore people fought for healthcare uh tamil nadu incidentally is one of the better healthcare systems uh on the other hand in north india there are the states which uh, always have lagged behind in healthcare uh i just want to uh, quickly take this opportunity to comment on uh, uh, what i think uh, something that archana raised which is uh, if you know when the british left us we they tried to suggest the nhs kind of model because this is something that you will identify with in, in ireland and uh, in the early days actually if you see all the policy documents in india they actually all talk about universal health care uh, etc but somewhere along the line we moved away uh, one can blame it on many things uh, the why of it is still not very clear to everyone uh, but perhaps Uh, one thing is that uh, i mean i have been think a lot about this why are we like this and well, i think one of the thing we must understand is that we perhaps the dominant narrative in india is uh, is you know fate and destiny so uh, we are like this and this is what is uh, is what is in store for us and you know that fate and destiny is something which is very strong uh, as a as a thought Yeah, well that rings the bells in Ireland. I must say there's a cultural tradition of fatalism in Ireland which is also part of the political culture in the sense that it lowers expectations and it means that that people have already, you know, I I hate to use the phrase priced in, but they've already anticipated disappointment and frustration. Other countries have very high expectations and they becomes part of the political ag- agitation in some sense. So perhaps that's part of the dynamic there. Um Kenton I wonder if I could ask you this is an interesting comment that's come in from a, a colleague who works in public health I've in Perry and in UCC University College Cork and I've makes an interesting comment about uh, health and social justice being inseparable I think it's quite a helpful way to put it and partly because it really picks up on a point that I think is has struck me and I think has been helpful today even in, in reinforcing which is the sense that the the COVID-19 crisis is really about the order of values Um I mean it is it is a health crisis and has to be understood in those terms but it is also a crisis in the order of values so do you find that you're you know as a philosopher as somebody who teaches philosophy that that's a subject you're bringing into the classroom is it some is it are there opportunities to talk with your students about these kinds of questions Yeah I do think that the uh, question of social justice has to be linked to uh, pedagogy in this case a caring pedagogy uh so i have been working in the uh, field of care ethics and i've been uh, thinking about how care ethics uh, uh, is uh, very significant these days because my students like coming to class uh, several of them who would cut class uh, during the face to face classes ended up coming to the online classes and when i asked them how come you come to the online classes you never came to class last year when we were face to face uh their point was that uh, well um we kind of prefer this because we are able to connect with the teacher better we are able to 
uh, speak our minds out and uh, it is more therapeutic. Primarily, of course, they, they're coming for the therapy part of it, you know, uh, because in the course of the grief, uh, I have a student who lives in Dharavi and uh, he has no access to um, uh, spaces, you know, for um, uh, connecting. And so he has to, uh, there are about eight people in a uh, small room and he has to sit in a corner with a mobile phone. Uh, but then uh, in the process, he's able to chat and he's able to uh, articulate and connect with the rest of the world, which he cannot do because of the lockdown. So in that sense, uh, it is a process of uh, even, um, you know, a kind of a therapeutic process, I think, you know, uh, 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 the, the classroom. Uh, but then my uh, worry is that this uh, pedagogy, you know, which is earlier, which was earlier restricted to very, uh, it was very business-like and, uh, you know, delivering goods and delivering assignments, delivering degrees. Uh, things have gone haywire because we are not giving degrees on time. Uh, assignments are not coming on time. So obviously uh, the other, the part, other, panelists have raised the question of health. So that is the backdrop against which this pedagogy takes place. So we can't really segregate things, you know, and we need to look at things in a holistic way. Uh, my students find uh, uh, philosophy particularly uh, valuable uh, uh, in the co context of the pandemic, and they've been writing very good assignments and so forth because they're able to um, uh, think about their lives via and in fact one of the problems also is that everyone wants to connect everything to the pandemic you know whatever they are doing and that becomes a kind of a reductionism too so it is hindering that uh, uh, ed education in the classic mode you know i want to teach the hume and the lock and all that and you know we want to see how how can they speak to the pandemic so somewhere there is an uh, a, a extraordinary uh, emphasis on the contemporary what is present uh, and i think it is here that turning to the history uh, that Archana just brought up uh, is very important because when we think of uh, someone like um, um, uh, Pandita Ramabai or Savitri Bai Phule, uh, you know, they, uh, they were women in the pandemic context who um, uh, uh, were in uh, social reform, who were in politics, let's put it as politics, uh, in the 19th uh, and the early 20th century. And one of the big uh, questions they raise at that time is precisely this whole problem of segregation, uh, which has become so inherent in India. So my worry is that the segregation that of caste that Archana has talked about, uh, one of my colleagues is here, uh, Professor Narayan is here. Uh, we often talk about it, uh, that, uh, that that segregation, caste segregation has is playing itself out in the digital divide because those without who don't get access to smartphones, laptops to do their homework and so forth are typically people from underprivileged ca caste they're typically um, uh, poor uh, because most people from underprivileged castes are poor. So it is the Brahminical patriarchy that is uh, playing itself out in the domain of pedagogy and the digital mm -hmm. divide, I think, you know. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to come to Opik and to pursue a question that you raised about the, the place of art in this moment. Um, I think there's been a struggle to maintain the relevance of art and to try to think it through. and there have been different definitions. Some have been that art is consoling and even distracting. So those are the slightly different phenomena. And others, the, the discourse of well-being, that, that, that the arts are somehow to contribute to our, 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 our sense of either getting through but a purpose and place in the world. Have you come across any definitions of, of art that you think at this moment of crisis that have been particularly persuasive to you? Or do you think we really are struggling to say, where is the center of human existence at this moment of disruption? You're, you're, you're muted there, Opik. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think then we are struggling. And you see, the other thing that has come with the whole ideology of being an artist is solitude and being an individual and all of that, which has 
completely been broken down now because now the making of art, caregiving and, and working at home, you know, being involved in doing things, you know, in, in not having a studio space in which to run away to or a classroom to run away to or a study to sit and think in because it's usually in the study that somebody is isolating. So, so you know, you are in there. So these are extremely important questions about space, about our cohabitation with other human bodies, about mortalities. And the way I choose to deal with it is to actually stop talk, calling art art, you know? Mm -hmm. And we just sit and we, we, we think in ways that are effective, critical, political about life and about the immediate and about, and, and about the motto. And if out of that, a certain transformation of sensibility happens, which then indirectly happens to remake you as a creator or a writer or as, or as an artist, fine. If it stops you from being an artist for the rest of your life, that too is fine. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the immediacy of the situation is such that, that we cannot really privilege a life choice like this anymore and we are as as i'm speaking things are happening you know yeah i would i i guess my own impulse is to think of of art and culture as the meaning making domains of human experience and that therefore should be resources within this moment but it doesn't follow that it's an immediate translation or even that that making of meaning in a sense making can take place in the moment itself it may be it may be retrospective I think there are unquestionably a whole series of different kinds of political social dislocations that are going to happen and rethinking of the order of value. So maybe that's something we have to think of as, as a future project rather than one that which is instantaneous um, and, and occurs a step <clears throat> in, in lockstep with the progression of, of the crisis itself. Um, Arch, I wonder if I could ask you a question that's come in from our colleague Nata Dovere, who is thanking, by the way, all the speakers for their insightful comments. Uh, but this is one I thought you might want to comment on. She said, are we witnessing a classical process of pauperization and differentiation, ultimately a wiping out of the rural society? I know you have interest in, 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 in rural India and rural society. Would you go as far as to say that? Do you think that these are really forces that might be as, as much as eradication going on? Or is it more repeating of a, of a familiar pattern in terms of the, the, the distinctive relationship that you were commenting on between urban and rural in India? I mean, that's, that's a question for a dystopia, isn't it? That's, that's what's happening. Um, I, I don't know that I would go so far, but of course, uh, I think that there certainly is a difference in um, scale in terms of what's been happening historically in policy making for rural India and healthcare in rural India. Um, uh, well, some of the things that have been coming out of, especially, I mean, uh, Sanjay, I think you mentioned uh, that Bihar and UP especially have been pretty chronically lagging when it comes to healthcare in rural parts of the states. Um, I think we're seeing an intensification of that because the reporting that's coming out of that part of the country has been very much focused on the lack of communication in the past two months between, well, from the lines of hierarchy in terms of you know state policy making for healthcare from from the you know state level ministry of health to the local village um panchayats uh like local governing body um that is responsible for distribution of say masks or ppe to individual healthcare workers who go into villages to do their um work, right? Because not everyone can access a primary healthcare center even. So there are a trained cadre of ASHA workers who go into individual villages to raise consciousness and raise awareness about COVID and identify people with symptoms and, you know, hopefully encourage them to isolate. Although, of course, there's a lot of stigma associated with that as Raghav pointed out. Um, so I think that the thing that has changed in terms of what's happening to the rural in this wave is that this line of communication has completely broken down. That's what I'm reading from, you know, people that I work with in rural Tamil Nadu. Um, and 
I haven't worked in rural Bihar, but that's what I've been reading from the reportage there. Um, and I think that there is not just a lack of communication, but a lack of material distribution of any kind of protective gear for these ASHA workers whose duty it is to go into individual villages and identify COVID people suffering from COVID related symptoms. Um, Thank you. Yes, I, I had a question actually for, for Raghav, if I might. Um, I suppose in, in, in Europe and in, in, in North America, there's such a focus on, you know, the, the order of values is structured by economic interests, which are set against, you know, the impulse of care and responsibility to lock down in favor of those who might be at risk and so on. I mean, I'm just picking up on what you're saying is, is that kind of economic discourse, I think it, it has a very different inflection in India. Is it part of the whole of what drives public conversation or is it a different, a different, does it occupy a different space? Well, there, it is part of, uh, you know, public conversation, but, you know, public conversation to the extent that it can be accommodated in public. Uh, you know, the, this, the, the, the shift from, I would I would point uh, the it's not just happened today or it's been happening for some time the shift away from a social citizenship based entitlement to a market commodified market based model of welfare uh, that actually is, is at the core of what is driving uh, all, you know, the the impacts both in rural areas as well as the urban areas that that uh, Sanjay talked about um, the, the discourse that that happens in, in economic circles and you know the public discourse on economy and so on you know this aspect comes but it, this aspect is not actually in the limelight uh, it's not highlighted uh, because you know many of these questions about about this the project that i uh, talked about is a hindutva neoliberal project you know it, it has an exclusionary uh, you know angle to it you know it demolishes the solidarities of of, of class or caste to the construction of you know gender, family, nation in, in, in their identities, and it has so many ramifications in so many realms. You know, it's in terms of population regulation, governance of populations, you know, uh, move from welfare, uh, as I said, social uh, entitlement to welfare, commodified welfare model, as well as undermining labor rights to uh, labor courts. Uh, mind you that during this uh, period, COVID, in the first wave about 44 central labor courts were merged into four labor courts. That has massive, massive implication for, you know, uh, labor market itself, you know, the flexibility of labor market. And it's going to drive a lot of people, um, uh, very flexible and uh, casualization that's going to happen. And the most hit in that is essentially women. Uh, in, in, in These kind of discourse happen, uh, but you don't have that kind of space that you have uh, you have uh, would have in, in other countries. Uh, um, I'm conscious of time, and we're 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 running close to our our, our available hour. Sanjay, I wonder if I could come to you um, since you're working in the in the in the, in the medical system, the healthcare system. Do you have any projections about where you think things might be going? And there's obviously is a vaccination program, and I've you know seen various statistics on the levels of vaccination. Are you very, I think, slightly improving? Are, do you see a, you know, the potential for rapid improvement or are you more pessimistic about what might be happening over the next few weeks and months? So there is some uh, evidence in some parts of the country, especially Mumbai, that uh, we are seeing a slow decrease in, in cases. But of course, the hospitals are still full, especially the intensive care units. Uh, vaccination, as you know, we are running very slow. Uh, uh, I think we are going to take a lot of time to reach that critical level of uh, proportion of uh, uh, citizens to be vaccinated for it to make an impact uh, on everyone. Uh, predictions? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. COVID has taught us not to make any predictions, and most predictions have not come out to be true. But one of the things that worries me uh, so one thing is that we are seeing a lot of uh, chronic illnesses. Uh, you know, there is something called long COVID, but we are beginning to see that and how the healthcare system is going to cope with it. Um, if there is indeed uh, some 
cause for optimism and hope it is in the fact that perhaps as never before uh, we are discussing health in india um, public memory is very short in india so I, I don't know whether that translates necessarily into a sustained interest in health but i can see that in the next few elections taking place in india in health will certainly move up on the priority uh, and that's that's really the the silver lining if there is any okay um we should draw to a close there i can uh, i just wanted to thank all of you um very warmly for taking the time today i've learned an enormous amount of the situation i think there are many analogies with situations we've been experiencing in ireland points of solidarity and contact areas where we can we, where we can learn and exchange i think uh, uh, and create a, a, a more just and intelligent relationship to this ongoing crisis um so thank you very much uh on behalf of everybody attending today i couldn't do justice to all the questions that came in there are a great many different comments and things thank you uh, to our audience for for joining us today so again thank you very much yeah thank you dan thank you bye bye, -bye.